Hello, everyone. So welcome to Cosmic Sandbox uh, Season 1, Episode 1. And uh, today we are gathered here to actually talk about different perspectives of the challenge theme, Earth Observation Application for Disaster Management and Risk Reduction. We had our first webinar in November 13th on uh, Space for DRM by Shirish Ravan from UN Spider. And right now we have here uh, Quentin Vesperan, who will be talking about law and policy, and Lydia from the Pacific community will be talking about um, community resilience building. And we have a couple of more speakers in the session too, uh, Mr. Taras and uh, Luciano, who will be talking about uh, technology and business perspectives. So let's get ahead. Now, first, let me introduce a little bit about APOSA and what is this Cosmic Sandbox is about. And then we can move on with our speakers and the talk. So APOSA is actually a multi it is an initiative which started as an initiative by a multinational team of young professionals. And what we are trying to build is to provide a platform, a simple continuous platform where experts and uh, the community can come together and discuss and build something without any, uh, any other uh, constraints. So that is what we are trying to provide and uh, we are hoping that we would achieve it in the coming years, in the coming months. Uh, so Cosmic Sandbox is one of our flagship event, uh, which is based on multidisciplinary design thinking approach. And uh, what we are doing through Cosmic Sandbox is to bring people who are in different domains and make them understand how each domain are interacting with each other or impacting each other to actually create the solution. So the problems are not specific to technology, not specific to law, not specific to policy. It all has to come together to actually achieve something in reality, right? So that is exactly where we, we are trying to focus. So bring things together and you will have this whole perspective of what are the things that are actually, you know, in priority as a problem and from which domains are these this can vary from challenge team to challenge team, the topic to topic, but yeah, this is the whole idea of um, multidisciplinary design thinking that we are trying to do. And right now we have here our uh, sandbox participants and our speaker and the co-founding team, and of course our volunteers to help us out. And I welcome all of you to this uh, webinar today. And right now uh, we have uh, Quentin here who will be, who is our uh, mentor and uh, who is one of the most important reasons why we are all gathered here today and APOSA is existing. So we uh, actually, we all met uh, through APSJOW, uh, which is organized by SCAC. And uh, Quentin was our uh, working group mentor and moderator. And he has ever since been our mentor for the past year. So. Yeah, without further ado, I uh, invite Quentin to start with his talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sindhu. I'm really glad to, to be part of, of one of your first big events. Uh, and, and I'm really impressed by all the things you've done in, in one year. Uh, as you said, starting from an initiative from a working group at APSGOW and, and now already having invitations in by prestigious organization side event at APRSAF. Uh, it, it's quite amazing uh, what you have done. And, and so yeah, congratulations for that first before starting. So so hello everyone. Um, as Sindhu explained, I'm, I'm Quentin Verspiren. I'm currently an assistant professor of space policy at the University of Tokyo. So, so initially I'm an engineer. Um, so I, I studied up to the, the master degree um, space engineering, uh, mostly on the upstream part, uh, so developing satellites, small satellites. Uh, but now uh, I have switched to, to the other side, to the dark side, uh, to space policy. And I've done a PhD in public policy. And I'm mostly teaching um, space policy of developing countries, uh, as well as space safety, sustainability, and security. And disaster management is something that I've worked on uh, a bit in the past while I was still doing engineering. So, so I'm glad to come back to this and, and discuss this topic with you today. So I will talk about more generally space application for disaster management and also extend it to, in general, Earth observation data sharing 
and trying not to overlap too much with what other speakers uh, will do, uh, and in particular, trying not to repeat too many things that were said by uh, Shiris last, uh, last week or two weeks ago. So uh, after a rough overview of what we mean by space applications, but I'm sure you're all aware of that now, uh, we'll look at the case of disaster management and then delve into uh, more the, the policy and diplomatic part of my presentation. Uh, why I'm supposed to be here today. So the issue of data policy uh, and existing examples of international satellite data sharing frameworks, in particular for disaster management. When we talk about space applications, uh, we are often talking about three main um, services. Remote sensing, to put it simply, taking pictures uh, from the sky in various wavelengths, depending on the application you're, you're aiming at. Communications, so transferring data from one point to, to another on Earth through a satellite. And positioning, navigation, and timing, PNT, that is basically the service provided by satellites like the GPS, uh, so Global Navigation Satellite System. So to as, as explained in the name of the service, it allows you to know your position, to know the best trajectory from point A to point B, and to know the time. Um, and while the, the first two applications are fairly straightforward and it's easy to imagine what they entail, uh, PNT is, is often uh, less understood, but uh, equally as important. And, and even I would say in terms of how our society works, uh, PNT is integrating in various aspects of our society and is in that sense, a very critical uh, space application for any kind of field, including uh, disaster management. So now if we go directly on disaster management, and I know you will have presentations that are more technical, so I will just give a few examples that I believe are, are important and relevant uh, to the region. And first of all, and, and that's a pity that I'm not going after Litea because I, I will have to give a bit of overview of, of disaster management, but what is important to, to understand is that um, when we talk about disaster management, disaster risk reduction, uh, whatever we call it, uh, it includes many, many different things and many different phases. And that's why I use this figure from the United Nations. Um, it's usually interesting when addressing the issue of dealing with disasters, to put it simply, uh, by looking at the full cycle of, um, of disaster management starts really early on with prevention and mitigation. So trying to understand your environment, the potential risk, and kind of trying to um, adapt your environment, your practices, your life, your infrastructure to a potential disaster that may happen one day. And then the closer you arrive to disaster, the phase of preparedness, so that entails, for instance, uh, predicting on a, I would say, shorter time frame, uh, the fact that maybe there will be heavy rain, uh, there will be a storm, there will be a cyclone, etc. And then the phase that is the post disaster phase. So after the disaster occurs, how do you respond to it? How do you recover from it in the short term? And then how you, I would say, come back to a situation that is fairly similar to what you had before the disaster, or I would say even having improved your infrastructure so that you can sustain future disasters. So from prevention to reconstruction. And space technologies can contribute to any of these phases. And so of course, I will not illustrate all of them. We can do that in the discussion part if you're interested. But, but it's important to understand that whatever you want to do, whatever disaster you want to face, you will have a direct or indirect contribution of space technology. And to, to give a few illustration of, of this, I, I always like to start by the most general uh, perspective. Most of the disasters that are happening uh, around uh, the world and that are, as a matter of fact, the most deadly are what we call hydrometeorological disasters, meaning it's just a question of weather. And, and a huge part of the answer on how to save lives is basically have accurate weather forecasts. Um, and 
for those of you from previous generation, probably not our generation, uh, that knew weather forecasts before space, um, they can understand the huge contribution of, in particular, geostationary weather satellites uh, on improving greatly our ability to predict uh, the weather. And so I, I used uh, the example of what uh, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US is doing, NOAA. Um, and typically, the, the main type of satellite application for weather forecast are so measuring infrared, so as to analyze the type of clouds, the height, so the, 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 the how can I say, yeah, the height of clouds, um, and to be able to determine whether they will lead to heavy rains, to storms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as well as more straightforward um, visible imaging uh, that will help scientists understand the shape of the clouds, uh, particularly whether there is a typhoon uh, coming, and also by comparing very successive image uh, patterns in the movement of clouds and so predicting uh, in the in the short uh, future whatever uh, kind of um, severe or, or not so severe weather can, can happen. And, and this is something that we use every day, basically, in our weather forecast. Uh, and, and in countries like Japan, for instance, uh, there was a huge change um, when Japan started to have geostationary weather satellite, because it's an island, very mountainous. So it's really complicated uh, to predict the weather. And so satellite is absolutely critical. And it's, of course, combined with a lot of sensors on the ground to measure temperature, pressure, um, humidity, et cetera. Um, so, which is related to one of the group's application on cyclone. Um, the second group focuses on floods, and I didn't know that when preparing this presentation, so it's a, it's a good coincidence. But flood is also something uh, that space can provide very um, convenient and concrete contribution to uh, predicting. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I'm giving you the example here of the University of Tokyo that maintains um, a, a platform to follow almost on a daily basis the happening of floods around the world. And for those of you that are living uh, in Southeast Asia currently, you may know that nowadays there are uh, important floods in the Mekong, seasonal floods. And, and it's quite visible on this kind of map using a passive microwave sensor. So just observing a microwave uh, coming from the ground, uh, you can detect water very efficiently and you can uh, know uh, with a very high um, frequency, uh, time frequency, whether floods are happening and potentially react quickly to, to flash floods in the Mekong River, for instance. Um, another application that I always find uh, quite, quite impressive and on what space technology can do is measuring the deformation of the ground using uh, radar satellites. And, and what I always find impressive, of course, scientifically is very easy to explain, but is that with satellites that are potentially at a thousand kilometers from the Earth, we are able to detect the movement of the ground uh, even below one centimeter. Uh, and, and it's extremely useful for all that deals with basically tectonic movements, um, so earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruption. Um, so I, I used the, the illustration uh, up there from the USGS of uh, the deformation. So this is a volcano. This is the, the crater that you can see here. And you can see that uh, this uh, colorful lines show that the ground is basically getting higher. Um, and what does this indicate? It indicates that the magma coming from deep inside the Earth is progressively moving upwards. Uh, and so it's about to come out in an eruption. And so the volcano itself is inflating a little bit. But it is something that, unless you have very good space technologies, you cannot detect movement of the ground that are around one or two centimeters. Uh, similarly, in an earthquake prone region of uh, Los Angeles, uh, it's very useful to, to measure ground deformation using satellite. And the final example that I wanted to use was more straightforward uh, use typically. So the previous one was a kind of disaster preparedness type of application. And this one is a typical 
um, disaster uh, so response. There was a landslide in Puerto Rico. This is, was in 2017, and Digital Globe, now called Maxar, uh, has amazing, uh, mostly spy satellites that they use for military purposes, but also for disaster management. And so it allows a government or local authorities to know quickly, okay, do we expect that what kind of houses were affected, uh, how many people may be under uh, the, 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 the landslide, um, so how many, what's the response team we need to send, how do we need to send the response team, Can will they be able to use cars or are the road uh, cut? Do we need to send helicopters, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of very straightforward way to react quickly uh, to, to a disaster and get early information uh, and to be able to respond perfectly. I uh, just want to react briefly on, I, I was um, fascinated by the fact that uh, Jim's team decided to focus on malaria because as he said, uh, it will probably be extremely complicated to find uh, direct satellite applications on malaria. Um, there are some, and it's mostly, I would say, in that case, I showed you very direct kind of application of satellite. Malaria would probably require more indirect uh, kind of contribution from satellite to understand, for instance, an environment that would be prone to developing mosquitoes or certain type of mosquitoes or using uh, some kind of IoT satellite communication to be able to track uh, how many patients you have in remote areas where you don't necessarily have phone connectivity and so the government cannot track uh, potentially uh, epidemic explosions, this kind of things. But, but I, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what this group will present in particular because there is no good answer. There are plenty of things that can be done and that are fairly complex. Uh, but, um, however, all the things that I've showed are nice, I would say, in theory and, and very convenient for rich countries that can afford having this uh, multi-billion dollar satellite infrastructure allowing this kind of monitoring. But as you, as you probably all know, uh, most satellites in the world are owned by a handful of countries. US, China, Russia, Japan, France, United Kingdom, India. And after that, it's not even worth plotting country by country because it's, it's really too small to show on this graph. Which means that most of the countries that suffer a lot from disasters, and I just remove here India and Japan that are very disaster prone, but most of the countries that suffer from disasters are also countries that usually cannot afford having a large satellite infrastructure. They have sometimes a few satellites, but, but very limited. And so what I want to, to show by that is that we have amazing technologies to help with disaster management, but those who really need it don't have, often don't have access to this technology. Hence the issue of data sharing. And that's now that I shift, and I'm a bit late on my time already, but that's now that I shift to the more policy and diplomatic kind of part of my presentation on what are the challenges, so the legal and policy challenges of data sharing. And in the question, we can talk about the technical ones, if you will, if you want. So, and I want to start with a concept that is data policy. So a data policy is critical when we talk about data sharing or data exchanges, because it is, to put it simply, the set of rules that will explain how the data can be shared, for what purpose, with whom. Uh, so basically, when entity A, whether it's a country, a company, an NGO, has some data and country B needs the data, what is the procedure so that country B can get the, the entity B can get the data from entity A? And so there are various elements that need to be included in a data policy. What type of data we are talking about? Is it raw data, process data? What kind of spatial resolution, time resolution? Is it if applicable, anonymized data, aggregated data, et cetera, et cetera. So first you define what are we talking about? And then the, the bulk of the data policy is restrictions that you put on access to the data. With whom you will share the data? It's very different if you share with military actors, civilians, researchers at university, commercial companies. Uh, for what purpose? Is it for emergency? Uh, relief? Is it uh, for commercial application? Is it for education? 
also, do you sell the data or do you provide it for free? Um, you can have different uh, pricing and attitude depending on the situation. If it's a disaster, you will give it quickly and for free. But if it's for a commercial user, you will sell it at a high price because you have your cost when you generate the data. Also, uh, what is the process by which entity B will be able to request the data from entity A? Will there be screening? Is it done online? Is it done with old fashioned paperwork, et cetera, et cetera? And this is a bit cherry picking, but after you share the data for a specific use, to what extent NTTB will be allowed to resell the data, share it with a third party, et cetera, et cetera. So read rules on redistribution. And if we look at the case of the ASEAN, uh, I will not explain everything on this very heavy slide. Uh, it's uh, issued, it's come from a paper that I wrote a few years ago. It's easily available online. So, so please check it if you're interested. Basically, the ASEAN is a place where you have roughly half of the countries that have satellites, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and half of the countries that have no satellites. So, and it's a political union the Association of Southeast Asian Nation that has um, common policies on disaster management, even a bit on space. And so it makes sense that the countries that have data would share with those that have no data. In addition, with the fact that in ASEAN, countries are so geographically close that most of the time, if a typhoon happens on one country, it will impact the other. So there is a real relevance in sharing data. The fact is all the space countries in ASEAN, those having satellite, none of them has a national data policy, meaning it's extremely complicated to know what kind of data they have, to know how to get it. And even if you know that they have certain data, you have your contact, what's the procedure to give it? You know, it's very unclear. And in most ASEAN countries, it's, it's very unclear. Uh, there are some of them have practices that work, Indonesia managed to make it work, uh, Vietnam managed to make it work, uh, but it really hampers the potential of data sharing and I would say um, mutual help in ASEAN. Uh, and I'm already almost over my time, so I will stop here, but basically there are good examples around the world of data policies. Uh, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this field, to look at Germany. That has a policy that is very simple, clear, and transparent, meaning that you know what kind of data is available and you can check by yourself whether you have a chance of getting the data if you request it. So you don't spend weeks applying for some data that you may not get. Check, okay, am I eligible? And if you're eligible, you will apply and you're almost sure that you will get it if you follow this simple algorithm clearly. Um, one specific type, uh, an interesting type of data policy is what we call open data policy that was chosen uh, by certain governments, in particular the United States. And basically the principle is that uh, the data that come that was generated from satellite paid by the people's tax from federal funds should be available to anyone for free. It's like a public good. And, and a, the, the typical example of that is the Landsat program. That is a very old program since 1972. They monitor the entire planet. It's very useful for typically climate change because you have a lot of historical data. Uh, and since 2008, all the data from Landsat uh, has been made available and it gave a boost of research, economic benefits to the point that by choosing to make this data available for free, um, it's economically more viable for the US government because when you sell the data, you don't sell that many pictures. But when you make it public, it generates so much economic benefit or even benefit in terms of disaster management um, that you will have an influx of tax that in the end will be beneficial uh, for the, the US uh, Treasury. Uh, another country that, um, not country, but uh, organ. I would say supranational organization that decided to follow the same practice is the European Union with the Copernicus program. Uh, that is a very comprehensive program that delivers around 12 terabytes of data, satellite data per day on climate change, um, ocean monitoring, atmospheric monitoring, land, 
and also for security and emergency management applications. And everything is available for free to anyone on the planet. And finally, uh, I want to mention a few examples of international satellite data sharing frameworks um, that I think you should look at uh, when you do your research, because they can give you a good example of what is going on around the world. Uh, to, so it's not only about disasters, but, but it, it has an impact on disasters too. The oldest successful example that is often overlooked is the World Meteorological Organization. It's a very old organization that for decades has been making sure that satellite data uh, for uh, weather forecasting is being shared all around the world and that countries that don't necessarily have the, 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 the budget to purchase, uh, I don't know, two or $3 billion weather satellites will still be able to have access to reliable data from, uh, I would say, richer countries, <coughs> sorry. And since 2003 in particular, the WMO has strengthened um, its um, space dimension by creating satellite uh, systems around the world. And, and it's really international. I mean, you have an integration of data from the US, Europe, UMETSAT, uh, India, Russia, China, Japan, it's rare to see all these countries sharing data, so, so it's, it's a true success. Uh, and then you have an entity that um, I will not have much time to explain, but you should look at. It's called the Group on Earth Observation. It's an NGO based in Geneva, or an intergovernmental uh, organization, sorry, based in Geneva, created in 2005, whose single goal is to make sure that satellite data can flow seamlessly around the world, across countries, across boundaries. And their goal and the way they were created by many countries is to create what they call the GEOS, a global Earth observation system of systems. So connecting the systems of China, of Russia, of the US, of France, of some private companies, of some universities, so that whenever there is a data that is useful for someone, this person can find it and get it. And there is a technical aspect to that, so some kind of standardization uh, for data exchange, of course. But there is a lot of what I mentioned before, data policy. So how to harmonize practices and policies around the world so that you don't spend weeks or months processing paperwork to get data that is not that sensitive and that you could get almost automatically on an online platform. And the find my two final slides on, uh, again, organization to share data, but this time focusing on disaster management. Uh, first, because we are dealing with um, the Asia Pacific region in this workshop, I want to mention uh, the Sentinel Asia uh, initiative. That is a regional framework initiated uh, originally by the Japanese space agency, JAXA, through the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, so APRSAF, that is the event that APOSA's cosmic uh, sandbox is a side event of. So, so it's very relevant uh, for us today. And basically the principle of this is that uh, more than in other regions of the world, um, Asia Pacific is highly divided between some of the world's most advanced space countries, Japan, China, uh, Korea, India, mostly Japan and India. China is not part of this framework. Um, and countries that have really access to nothing. And basically the principle is that when a disaster occurs, any country, sorry, any country in Asia Pacific can request, can make a request to various organizations, mostly the Asian Disaster Reduction Center, that will then contact the leading space agencies in the region, JAXA, ISRO, GISDA, so that can you provide us data right now about this specific place? And whoever has a satellite around there at the time will take the picture, transfer the picture to other entities called data analysis nodes, universities, research center that will process the data so that the people on the ground in the country that suffered from the disaster can use support from Earth's observation to make decisions. And in the case 
that the disaster scale is too large to be dealt with by regional agencies, or if JAXA is run GISDA by a, a lack of luck, don't have a satellite around there at the time, the request can be upgraded to, I would say, the, the big sister of Sentinel Asia that was created by France uh, some time ago. That is called the International Charter, Space and Major Disasters. That is basically the international uh, version of Sentinel Asia. And that includes literally everyone. So European Space Agency, French Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, various American agencies like USGS, NOAA, uh, Chinese Space Agency, Japanese, uh, Indian, uh, German, really everyone is part of this. So it's, it's kind of the, the bazooka. If there is a problem, you contact them and they will give you all the data you need uh, on 24-7. And it's, of course, not only used for Asia Pacific countries, it can be used by UN agencies, uh, can be used, there is now a new framework with GEO to facilitate requests from African countries. And, and these two organizations are really uh, wonderful organizations in that sense. There are, of course, sometimes some complexities on how to deliver the data to the final user that requested the data because the final user, if it's uh, some of the least developed countries, sometimes don't have experts that will be able to make decision from the data. So there need to be also some uh, decision-making support or sometimes even internet connection is not good enough in the target country. So that the, the process, even the process data cannot be transferred. But apart from this kind of technical detail that hamper sometimes the response, uh, these two organizations are framework that I encourage you to, to look at. And I will stop here because I'm way over my time. I apologize to Sindhu and Alina for that, uh, but it, it was nice to make this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Quentin. Uh, that was an insightful presentation for sure. And uh, the couple of points that was really tying to the concept of uh, the sandbox is uh, the way you showed all successful examples. So what we are trying to encourage the participants is also to look into the, these are community-wide problems, right? So there may be solutions that has already worked somewhere hidden, like a hidden gem, hidden gem. So discovering solution is also equally important rather than creating everything from scratch. So we were actually encouraging participants to look into the challenges, problems, but also all these hidden gem, which has worked earlier, that could actually be brought into spotlight once again and analyze. Of course, there has to be something that's challenging in it as well. You know, when you when you talk about implementing in a, in a community-wide um, uh, problems for a community-wide problem. So, uh, and, and then bring it to the table for the team to actually discuss about the viability and the constraints of those kind of uh, hidden gem solutions. So it, it was really you know, insightful to show those um, WMO and all this, the German data policy, for example, like it could be a place where they can start actually thinking, okay, this has worked at least on a national level. So what could they actually do on, on a national level or a regional level or an international level? So there could be some points that they could pick out of these things that, that is actually, you know, can be implemented to all these other levels of, or they could even use that as a reference to see what is exactly lacking and where is exactly the major bottleneck in the policy, data policy. So thank you for sharing those uh, wonderful information. I'm sure uh, the participants would have enjoyed uh, hearing it. Uh, uh, so to the participants, we do have a Q&A session after Lydia's speak, uh, speech. Uh, there will be a fireside chat where both the speakers will be available for you to take all your questions and they'll be having a discussion as well. So please hold on to your questions or post it in the chat box. Uh, that is always there, open to you. And uh, meanwhile, I'll, I'll invite uh, Lydia from the Pacific community. And our uh, apologies for all the uh, connectivity issues that you have experienced today, Lydia. We are very sorry about that. Uh, can you hear us? Um, is it? Hello? Yes. Uh, yeah. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Nice um, to have you here. Like, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm quite glad. I'm quite glad that Quentin's, Quentin went before me because 
he actually touched on, on, a, on a couple of things that, that we've realized in the Pacific uh, in this journey on trying to make the best use of um, data and technology that is available to us, um, you know, with, with, with really as part of a public good service um, that, that is being provided. And, you know, we've taken advantage of the, the services provided by Sentinel Asia, as well as the, the Space Charter. Um, and, you know, some of these paved the way in, in us being able to actually, one, better utilize the data that is available, but also match that with um, maybe fewer in-situ assessments than we would have probably have done maybe 10 years ago. So there's been quite a, a real improvement in the quality of the data that's coming through now, um, as well as the return time that's that's actually available to to, to countries. Um, Mbula, and thank you very much. I work for a regional organization in the Pacific. Um, and I had told uh, Sindhu today that I, I didn't really want to present because I actually wanted to have a chat with you during this webinar. Um, and part of this work was really to share and maybe in, um, encourage some discussion around some of the ways in which this community could actually get more involved and in, with, with, with the disaster risk reduction, you know, the sort of the climate change um, discussions that are actually taking place within our countries and, and by our regions. Um, the Pacific community, because it is a regional organization, invests quite a bit in one, trying to actually understand what are those disaster and climate risks uh, that the Pacific is actually trying to respond to. And number two is actually trying to meet um, some of the data gaps that we have in the Pacific region. And the third would probably be around the capacity development, um, around the use of that information that's produced, plus the um, some of the institutional changes that are then and the policy changes that are actually being made as a result of this. Um, so a, number, a while back, we had embarked on some work with the World Bank, and part of this was really to try and understand what were the risks related to disasters for the Pacific. Um, and in, in order to do that, we had to first one, come to terms with what were those um, hazards that we were talking about that we needed to really look into for the Pacific. And one way of doing that was actually looking back at the disaster catalogs that we had in the Pacific in the region. Um, and then as you see, and as raised and pointed by Quentin earlier, you know, hydrometeorological hazards come up quite high in the Pacific. Um, and, and I'm sure for, for Asia as well, you know, so flooding, uh, typhoons or tropical cyclones as we would call it here, um, coastal inundation, you know, all of these have a, have, have a, have a potential impact um, on our communities. And then the second bit of that puzzle was actually trying to understand what is it that we were actually trying to protect ourselves from. And, you know, trying to understand what those elements were that we needed to be looking at or what were those bits of pieces that, that were exposed to these hazards. And so we needed to actually do a stock take of, of those, of, you know, of, of buildings, of infrastructure, of population and of crops. And, and you know, the, the Pacific is exactly like Asia. Um, the central repository where you'd be able to source this data from is almost a pie in the sky. And for the countries who've been able to do it, congratulations. Um, and because our region is quite small, we decided that what we would do instead was to refocus our attention on trying to develop these regional repositories of data. Um, and to make these not only um, accessible and available, but that we would also try and ensure that the data itself that was being amassed could also be used for a number of purposes, you know, so that it, it had a, a more than one use to it. Um, so, you know, some of the data that was used included population data from population census that had been held in, in the countries, um, being able to project those to present time, um, looking at agriculture census, the, um, any, any hazard, hazard data or ha hazard inventories that were being amassed by countries. Um, what we did find was that satellite imagery for us provided a really key um, base data set that we could use to, to, to try and ex extract information around 
uh, locations of locations of infrastructure and buildings to map these out, pardon me, to also map out land use and land cover. Um, and also, and, and unfortunately we didn't do it at the time, but what would have been quite interesting was to also look at what those changes look like over time. Um, and because the, uh, our organization was the primary, um, the primary focal point for being able for procuring satellite imagery on behalf of other Pacific Island countries, um, we had quite a large uh, repository at hand, um, and and these were through uh, arrangements, you know, and agreements, you know, with the likes of the of digital digital globe as it was known in in that time. Um, there have been other players that that have come on board now that we're also engaging with. Um, so I mean, the, the, that's the, the, the data side. Uh, the bit that was actually quite interesting to us is what do we do with it. Um, and when we when we started to dig and to look at how could we actually make this data applicable, one of the of course one of the easy reflexes was to actually go to how can we actually start to inform um, post disaster response. And this is where our own discussions with with the likes of Sentinel Asia came about. Our own engagement, um, the organization I work for now is now a data analysis node. And for the very reasons that Quentin men mentioned, um, the limitations and the restrictions with uh, internet, uh, being able to download those large data sets, actually having people on standby who can actually analyze the data in a format and produce and deliver in a format that would actually be use usable or useful um, for decision makers, you know, became became part of the discussions that we were having to make on, you know, at the time that we were actually requesting these uh, collections or these uh, these acquisitions. Not a, not opportune. Um, I am glad, however, that at this point in time, you know, you, we do now have the humanitarian open street map that's now hot, that's now available, Copernicus, um, and other mapping and analysis services that actually turn some of that um, spaceborne imagery into data sets that we can, or information products that we can now use and pick up. Um, the bit that we also are able to negotiate for the Pacific is um, areas that are, are not covered through these charters um, where we can actually get specific imagery um, and to work and engage with the GIS and remote sensing communities within the countries. Um, and, and again, living in this virtual environment, you know, not now the getting that, that, that very large data set to countries is going to be as problematic as it, you know, more problematic now um, trying to ship them to get these data sets across. So what do these, um, these assessments inform? The humanitarian response, which, you know, primarily is about trying to understand what, imme what people's immediate need, what pe communities' immediate needs are in terms of, you know, water, water, shelter, food needs, health, um, and some immediate livelihood practices that could be supported to at least extend their, to, 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 to help, help them with an, a quicker early recovery time. So, you know, things like, do they still have gardening tools that they can actually access and use? Um, and where, where can we actually provide them? So I'm using the Royal We here, which includes a whole gambit of partners that work in this space. Um, and one of the things that we do agree on or try, have tried to agree on is when we're interacting with the community, what are we actually asking of them? And trying to actually understand so that we're not um, overburdening them with the influx of assessment teams that often go into communities. So one of the discussions that we've been having um, for some time now with a number of, you know, with, with basically the GIS and remote sensing community in the Pacific is, how can we backfill some of the damage, the, the need for that field assessment or in, in, in community assessments with, with some of these crowdsourced data and some of these mapping services um, that's being provided uh, globally? Um, the, the sort of the shifts that we're getting is where we're having to actually advocate to government that not all secondary data is to be viewed with a question mark that you can still make decisions um, and inform decisions using it. And this is really, you know, uh, probably one where this community with, you know, with, with the disaster risk management community could probably start to engage with, to look at, you know, where can we actually provide our, our technical expertise to match 
some of the questions that you have. Um, and for recovery planning purposes, you know, the, the sector, sector assessments tend to take place in the field or in, in the areas that are affected. Is there a possibility of actually being able to use impact modeling to be able to determine what those potential areas could be without having to do resource intensive um, assessments in the uh, in 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 the field? So for the Pacific, our, our, most most of our islands are quite uh, far apart, and it costs a fortune for us to send field teams out into uh, to do these assessments in the field or in the communities. Um, so as much as possible, where we were able to actually leverage remote sensed um, or even crowdsourced data, um, that for us would actually go, you know, is this is this data that you'd be able to use to, to, to try and drive some of the decisions that government has. What we're finding is that for decision makers, there is a definitely a need to be able to socialize them to what we're actually producing. Um, sometimes when you come from a technical, when you come from a technical side, you know, we're very excited about the high resolution data that we're able to produce or the high resolution imagery that we're able to actually acquire, the very beautiful maps that we're able to produce. Um, the worst thing is when you're presenting this to someone who's going to make a decision and they look at you with this puzzled look that says, I don't actually know what you're telling me and how is this going to make a difference? Um, so having those discussions around those key questions that they'd like to have addressed and for us to be able to go, we can do this with the data that we have, however, to address some of the other concerns that you may have around, um, for instance, are the are, are people living with disabilities in the communities taken care of would require someone on the ground to be able to take those assessments through um, there are other things like housing assessments that you could probably do quite safely remotely using imagery using um, other means that that you know that with the, with the tools that we have at hand um, why do we bother really and it's and it's that it's because that if, if we're not contextualizing the results to the person, the, the end user of the, of the data that we, the, the information products that we're producing, then we've spent all this time creating something that is not going to be used at all or not used to its, its fullest extent. Um, so having these discussions early on and actually understanding what those processes are, what those questions are, is actually quite integral to the work that we're doing right now. Um, capacity development is an ongoing one that we're, we're constantly getting asked. So we're trying to actually break it down to when you're talking about capacity development, what are we actually talking about? And what we've realized is it's not just about training. It's not just about, you know, going out to get your, um, your, your, your qualifications. Some of the capacity development can actually be done through mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Um, and again, you know, this community of practice that we're actually on right now could, you know, could be, could facilitate those discussions. Um, I'm glad that Quentin raised the open data, um, raised open data. Um, I, I come from a background where I am a strong advocate for open data, you know, where, where, where data, where, and where it can be, it should be. And a lot of the information products that we're now producing is actually categorized as open data, you know, and with Creative Commons attribution licenses to ensure that it's, it's available and that it's actually used. Um, some of the, 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 the more expensive single use licenses, you know, and in, for example, the satellite imagery, um, LIDAR data, we're having to negotiate that um, with, with people who purchase it as well as with with the vendor with the the firms that capture it, um, to get to get to to get the agreement that this is worth the investment made, and it really should be out in the public domain if it can be used to inform other investments by by governments as well as by um, other agencies, including the private sector here. The engagement with the end user. I mean, I'll keep talking about this. The, the, the engagement of user communities is really important. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that we need to work on um, from, from both ends, from, from the user perspective, as well as from the, the people creating the information. 
Um, and this, and, and part of this will actually help establish these strategic partnerships that we want to move into. Um, we're finding that in the Pacific, um, you know, we've sort of established these umbrella um, partnership arrangements that really for us help drive some of the work we're actually engaging with, country, with our Pacific Island countries on and with the development partners that we're working with. Um, the bits that we're actually trying to uh, hook onto it now is it's all well and good for us to be talking about things around legislation, policy, um, planning. Um, but where where are you deriving the information that you're using to feed feed into that? So you know, connecting our technical working groups again into some of these conversations that are taking place right now, so that you know we're not we're not just talking to ourselves. We're actually talking to something that would be quite useful. Um, so you know the and in these communities of practice, I find that pe people join them because they want to make a difference and they want to make a change and effect the change. And I think it's for us, for for me in 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 the community that I represent from the disaster risk management side anyway, um, it's to engage with your community to go. We can come together and do this. And I was really glad when Sindhu and Alina actually reached out to 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 me. Or to, to my organization to see, you know, would this be something that was worthwhile? And I think it actually bridges a gap in resources, in human resources that we don't have. And I think that a lot more of that sharing across our regions um, can only lend to, I think some, one is the partnership side, but I think also to some solutions, innovative solutions uh, that we probably wouldn't have navigated or maneuvered um, if, if we'd not have had these exchanges. Um, that's it for me, Sindhu, thank you. Thank you, Ritya. That was wonderful. I mean, there are so many things that we could, I mean, it, it instigates so many questions to think about, to ask you. And yeah, uh, it's, that was really wonderful. Thank you for uh, giving the talk. And uh, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, I'll bring both the speakers on floor uh, so that they both can, you know, interact with each other and also interact with the participants. So that officially, the session is open for Q and A, and uh, just uh, one minute. I'll try to see if I can spotlight both the speakers. Uh, just for hmm, add spotlight. So yeah, hopefully you can see both the speakers now on screen. And first of all, let's uh, open this floor for the participants to ask their questions. We also have a couple of questions already sent to us. Uh, so once they finish off, I will then you know uh, read out the, those questions so that they will be listening to the webinar or the recording to get your answers. So yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and start get ahead with it. Yeah. I think Sindhu, if you're okay there, already a few great questions from from jim in the chat and, sure. and i, I want to also to to react to litia's presentation thank you very much uh, for this I, I think it was really uh sindhu and and the team you made a good job uh putting us together because uh, it's very complementary i feel uh and, and i'm glad to to see some of the things that litia insisted on um like the access to data uh that you know, there is the theory, but then how to get data on the ground and for what purpose, um, not just, you know, giving kind of scientific scientific products or engineering products, but using it concretely for decision making and providing it in a way that is easy enough for decision making also, depending on the local capabilities. And, and these very concrete considerations, are, I think, are really useful to, to go beyond the sometime a bit, you know, nice theoretical uh, presentation that I gave that, that may be a bit more complex in real life. And, and to, to jump on one comment that, that Jim uh, made. Um, so one, uh, as you said, one of the one of the bottleneck is having the data reaching people on the ground who need it and that are not necessarily those producing the data most of the time. And, and Jim mentioned the idea of data reduction. And yes, that's true. That's one of the, the key challenges. But I would, to, to define it even more precisely, I would say that there are two ways of seeing how to reduce the data. Um, 
there is reducing the data in volume. This is probably the, the simple uh, level. The fact that most of the time the communication infrastructure on the ground is not good enough so that you can send a big amount of satellite data. Um, when you see Copernicus sharing 12 terabyte of data, obviously, uh, if you're in a, in a small community in Cambodia, you can probably not get much of this 12 terabyte of data uh, on your on your terminals. And so really the, the idea is to make the, the data processed enough so that you just have the exactly what you need and not more so that you don't because also your communication lines you shouldn't use them all just to get the data you have plenty of other things you have to do with this communication line in, in time of disaster but then also the other aspect that we could consider data reduction is in complexity so not only make the data small but make the data simple and actionable so that it can support decision making in a very efficient way um, because uh, not only because the local capabilities may not be enough to 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 have this knowledge of remote sensing to, to make good decision but also because by definition you're in terms of disaster you have to make 10 decisions every minute so so you need something that will tell you okay quickly there are people that are dying there they need water we need to re-establish electricity whatever you want to do but you cannot spend two hours for each situation thinking, oh, based on this map, what should I do? You know, so I think reducing in volume and complexity are probably the, the two angles that, that I can think of. And this leads to the other point by Jim that was excellent, the contribution of cloud computing. Because obviously all this data processing um, should be done way in advance. And, and it's an infrastructure that as the final user, you, you cannot possess, or even if you possess it, it's not the time during the disaster to deal with that. And I'm not an expert about that, but I've, if I remember correctly, uh, Amazon Web Services or uh, Microsoft Azure that are kind of the two leaders nowadays on uh, cloud computing are extremely involved in um, the space data, uh, for storage and analysis. And, and in particular, uh, I think that most of the historical data from Landsat, so you can imagine all the data collecting since the 70s, it's huge. I think a huge part of the useful data is stored on Amazon Web Services uh, and can be used directly on Amazon Web Services to produce uh, data products. So, so this is a, a pretty incredible contribution uh, from cloud computing. And finally, in terms of capacity development of capacity building, um, this is, uh, if I understood correctly, basically what UN Spider is doing. Most of the things they're doing, uh, they, they are not necessarily here to process the data or collect the data. They're not, a, uh, I would say, a big engineering machine. But however, if you check a bit what they're doing, they often, I, I don't know during the, the corona time, it's always a bit complicated, but in the past, they were organizing a lot of workshops uh, in various countries, in particular in Asia Pacific, to make them able to, to make better decision using uh, support from satellite data. That, that's basically what I wanted to, to comment on uh, Jim's excellent comment. Thank you, Gwenton. Uh, I see Rani, uh, not, yeah, go on, yeah. Hello, uh, hello, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Rene. I'm from the Philippines. So just a quick background. I experienced flash floods 10 years ago, which nearly cost our lives. Okay, so I'm really particularly interested in this question. I think this touches on law and policy plus community resiliency, which is good for both speakers. So my question, I'll just read it. Community resiliency to flash floods is wrapped around creating flood protection infrastructures, such as these engineering solutions and adaptive measures. However, we know that this only reduces the risk because we cannot guarantee total protection. So we call this paradox as the Levy effect, and it can be counterproductive at times because it gives us a false sense of security that we are safe. And when the Levy breaks, it poses higher risk. Okay, so this is what we call the leave effect, and it's a common dilemma in disaster risk 
management. So my question is, how do we revolutionize the community resiliency plan such that it encourages future human settlements to move away from the rivers rather than settling on these hazard-prone floodplains? Because we know civilizations have sprouted from these river networks and we are accustomed to living near the rivers. So in the perspective of law and policy and community resiliency, how can we what is your opinion on this? Is it better if we move away on the river plains or is it better if we live, if we learn to live with it? Or is it possible to learn to learn to live with it given our current rate of climate change? So that's my sorry it's too long, but that's a question. Thank you. Uh, speakers, you can feel free to take the question. Yeah. I think like maybe a little bit technical, I'm not sure. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm not uh, someone else is um, yeah. Yeah, I, I will let Lita speak on that because it's more, I think, her expertise. But I just want to clarify one point in your question. So sorry, which country are you from? I didn't catch that. Philippines. I'm Philippines. from the Philippines. Okay, so if you say 10 years ago, was it the Haiyan typhoon? Um, it's a typhoon before that, but ah, okay. I think for the past 10 years, we've been experiencing the, mm -hmm. we've been experiencing the worst types of typhoons, and we're, yeah. uh, we're, average, we're averaging 20 tropical cyclones every year. And every time we experience that, it feels like it's our first time dealing with it. So yeah. it's really frustrating. And, and actually, the, the reason I wanted to ask about Haiyan is because Haiyan and so the, the few previous typhoons uh, that, that causes this flood were the reason why the Philippines started a space program uh, and now has a space agency. Um, because when they analyzed uh, where there was an issue, um, the issue was that first, because the Philippines at this specific moment didn't have good access to satellite data, they were not able to predict flash floods and in high tide for those close to the, the ocean. And um, secondly, even when they started to have an idea that there would be high tide and flash floods, they didn't have the, I would say, non-ground infrastructure to easily contact um, communities that are a bit isolated. Uh, and, and that's why the, that's one of the reasons uh, why the, the Philippine National Space Development Program started after that uh, because they realized that if they had satellite probably thousands of lives would have been saved uh, and so of course so as you said philippines is still not there uh, the space program is in the process of being created but but at least there was some awakening on this specific aspect hi renee the i mean this has been the problem with a lot of the um, infrastructure protection that's actually being that has been designed because a lot of them are actually paid based on past experiences they don't actually include modeling that actually take into account climate change um, impacts um, you know one of the learnings that we've one of the learnings you know direct from the Tohoku tsunami is that there is no silver bullet for for protection um, that what we should be actually considering is that the suite, the suite of solutions that will actually help protect our community. Um, some of the hard ones are the ones that would probably be the, 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 the would probably reduce the would reduce the risk significantly. So some of the things around uh, human mobility, like just move, relocate out of that area. But again, these are not easy decisions to be made. Um, and you know that's 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 the world over, regardless of where we, we come from. Um, relocation is really a, a last resort for for many of us, um, and, and because of that, you know, it's tied to a whole lot of things around culture, around land tenure, you know, that that you could never really model um, when, if you're wanting to really assess or evaluate the risk in that particular area. The the bits around enforcement. Um, Urban policies is a is one that you know the there's a lot of policy and or plans around it, but the enforcement of those policies are actually quite difficult. Um, I've seen some of the best, you know, some of the countries with some of the best plans in place, 
And some of the things that really throw them out is that actually enforcement component, um, the resourcing to enforce. So the flip side of that is how can we get our communities um, to comply? And you know, part of that is actually understanding that in you know in the not so distant future, um, there are going to be these events that will exceed the, that flood protection that you have. But then knowing what to do, um, you know, if we can indeed forecast it. So the you know the flash flood guidance that's being established by the uh, WMO right now in countries, um, you know, which the expanded observation networks that that, that are that are taking place right now. I mean, it, it requires investment, but it does help um, help us understand what some of those future risks are um, for us. It's not an answer, um, but it's an interesting one to have, particularly when you're when you're working through some of these options with communities. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for answering. And I'd like to share a personal experience. After I live, I think, 100 meters from the river. So when the storm hit, <laughs> the entire first floor was really submerged. And we were given a relocation site by the government. But the problem lies with how, how are we going to get jobs? How are, we, how are we going to get livelihoods? Because we're usually thrown to the very rural areas where there's no opportunity. So the tendency for my people in the Philippines is to always go back, even though they're serious. So yeah, I'd like, I'd just like to share. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yeah, uh, yeah go yeah. on, Quentin. No, no, that, that's true that the, the compliance with uh, relocation orders and even not orders, but policies to incite for relocation is a big issue. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that often people come back because that's something that I often heard. Uh, actually, my, my wife uh, is a development consultant uh, and, and she used to work in the Philippines. And, and one issue that they had is that even in particular, actually, when they were giving a financial incentive to move, this often backfired because people left. And if, the financial incentive was still in place for the following years but because of a construction plan or something people tend to come back or other people were replacing them so as to claim you know this kind of financial incentive and so so it's probably not only in the philippines but i think it happens in many places and it makes sense because most of the time uh people who who suffer from from this kind of, of disasters are by definition low income. And so it could, could be a game changer sometimes this allowance for relocation. Um, so so this, this is very complicated. And from a policy perspective, uh, even when governments try to do good things, it's sometimes a, a nightmare in terms of concrete implementation. Okay, thank you. And I think my main takeaway is in this space law policy, goes hand in hand with poverty reduction because impoverished families well don't really have much choice in terms of relocation. I'll end my portion here, sorry. Thank you. Your audio is a little bit not clear. The last sentence we could not hear it clearly. I'm sorry. Um I'm what I said is that our, our my main takeaway for this discussion is Pay a law and policy in terms of using EO data for disaster risk reduction goes hand in hand with poverty alleviation. Mm, okay. The rich okay. family will always tend to go back to those. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah thank you so much, uh, Min. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, you know, the, the questions put forward by Rene. And uh, I think that was thought provoking for other participants as well to think about how these things go hand in hand and how it's hard to actually enforce a system, uh, even though there is, a, there is one. And yeah, I invite uh, next Jim uh, so we can switch between the participants to get the questions instead of continuously one person. So Jim, do you want to unmute and ask the question? I see you have posted a, a few on the chat. Uh, probably you will be the best person to pick one of it and you know go ahead with that. 
Okay, well, of course, thank you. Um, and as I said uh, before the recording started, um, um, yeah, you really challenged me to go out of my comfort zone, uh, thinking about these more um, yeah, earthly related uh, problems, disasters. Um, I'm extremely uh, space uh, geekish, let's say. So I look at the world through a space uh, uh, yeah, glasses, uh, let's say. And I really found it difficult to formulate good questions um, that, that, that are significant in the sense that I can really ask to these experts uh, and share their views. Uh, I ended up thinking more, yeah, what I think we have all experienced in the last uh, one and a half years, uh, the, the corona pandemic. And I think uh, this audience might also really be uh, uh, good people to, to answer this question. Um, so I come from the group that uh, is looking at malaria because of the uh, 400,000 uh, deaths, and particularly from children under the age of five, which is for me, a, uh, I'm a father of four children. It's a pain point to uh, see children perish. And, and I would like to do whatever I can to, to, to improve that and to stop that. Um, so let me formulate my, my question. I just wanted to give that context. So potential solution to lower the uh, annual uh, staggering number of deaths could be a vaccine called RTSS. Um, and so given the context of just coming hopefully out of the pandemic, although it seems to uh, continue and continue, I have a two-folded question. First of all, how do we ensure that COVID does not lower but instead increase the pace of development for such new vaccine research um, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, resources. Um, of course, when you have a priority, you need to reallocate, but of course it should not come at the cost of other very important, uh, um, you know, already longer existing threats to, to, to population. And so connected with that, a, a different way of formulating maybe the same question is, what lessons have we learned from the uh, COVID vaccination programs that can be applied for the benefit of other vaccination programs uh, from now on? Thank you. Yeah. I think maybe uh, the way we could approach this question would be, what is the learning in general? Perhaps, you know, maybe uh, from the way we respond to a, let's say an, an epidemic, or this could be drawn in parallel to some kind of a disaster, or yeah, th that is that is not exactly you know, metrological or hydrological, but yeah, so where the humanity comes into question, something like that. Yeah. Go ahead and take your own perspectives and share. That, that is really tough and and frankly uh, what i would say would be guesswork uh it, it's not it's not my expertise uh however something that is related and that could be important among the lessons from the from the covid is to have a system that help us track properly and have a proper picture of how the epidemic is is evolving and and that's something that has appeared as obvious in the COVID because it touched a lot of very rich country that had this infrastructure to monitor properly. Um, but uh, I feel, and again, I'm not an expert, so you, you can criticize whatever I will say, but I feel that um, malaria, even though uh, it's a disease that we have known for a long time, because it touches mostly countries with lower income and it's taken a bit less seriously and there is less, I would say, monitoring infrastructure. And here, uh, space can, can play a role. Uh, and I will just give the example of a project that I participated in uh, a few years ago. So at the University of Tokyo, we are uh, developing uh, IoT satellite. So basically a satellite that will be used for what we call store and forward communication which is a communication with a certain delay, um, collecting very small amount of data from a various place around the world. And so typical application is you have a lot of ground sensors uh, transmitting um, soil moisture, temperature, uh, whatever environmental parameter that you're interested in. And you will have very small uh, transmission device with very low power, I don't know, 20 watts, 30 watts, 
so that you can have simple batteries or small solar panels and your sensors collect this data all year round. And you send the signal to space and you have small satellite that will collect the data from all these transmitters, store the data in the satellite, and when it's above a place with a big ground station, we'll download all the data. And, and one application that we have uh, worked on, it was just a pilot project and I'm not involved anymore, so I'm not sure how it went, but was to simply give to any local dispensary or any kind of uh, nurse in any remote area of Asia Pacific, a small box with buttons to push. Um, one button for a malaria case, one button for another disease could be dysentery, whatever this is, maybe I'm saying diseases that are not existing in, in Southeast Asia. But, uh, and and the, the point of that is that if you have your small satellite, IoT satellites, then you will be, if you have enough satellites, you will be able to have a fairly um, real-time picture of all the malaria or dengue or dysentery cases across big areas of the world. And the only thing that will be required is this small box with this small antenna and a small battery to have a nurse or a doctor that pushes the button. And so, but this simple fact of knowing that, oh, there is a case there, there, and there. In most countries in Southeast Asia, there is no systematic approach to follow it. And then you can easily see if there is an epidemic, an explosion of cases in a specific area and how it propagates to another area. And it helps you to also understand the mechanism for propagation of this kind of virus. Um, so this is the kind of direct data collection on cases, but also, I mean, malaria is not a virus that appears on its own. It's carried uh, by uh, mosquitoes. So you can have also, and that's also something we studied, systems that um, exactly like weather monitoring station, you will have a system with a box that will attract mosquitoes and you will able with uh, AI to detect which type of mosquito it is. And you can have an idea of whether mosquitoes that are more prone to carry malaria are developing more in specific areas. You can also use remote sensing to be able to detect a type of environment that will be prone to the development and proliferation of this kind of mosquitoes. And so with various kinds of indirect approaches, you will be able to grasp a good picture of the potential malaria cases in specific region and then react by sending more uh, hydrochloroquine type of products or so it's not about vaccination this frankly i don't know much about but uh, to to give you an idea of a few simple application of satellite technology for malaria th this is what i could have in mind thank you quentin i just want to add uh, this point to to the biology team in general. So the very reason we have a biology team as part of this space, so there were five categories in the beginning, right? The very reason that we always try to retain biology is for the reason that it is not usually something that is tied to space. And it is even harder to find people who are working on space application that is related to a biological, you know, uh, epidemiology or something like that. It need not even be an epidemiological study, but let's say how you can already see that it's complex, right? And precisely that is the reason why we are introducing this biology topic, biological disaster, because that is something that has this multi-hazard problem in the future. So all the disasters right now, all the disasters that's happening that are there, we have some kind of system in place and some kind of understanding on how we can use and utilize these technologies to actually um, sort of forecast or respond or pre be prepared for it or have a futuristic plan on how we can tackle it. But the, the problem is that so far biological category was not included in any of these. And only recently in the UNSCAP report, they have explicitly mentioned that biological disaster has to be to study together with the rest of the things because it has this multi-hazard. It can actually trigger this cascaded approach where one um, event could actually result in another, in another, which was exaggerated when COVID happened. Even the vaccination centers could not be on reach because of all the floods and 
cyclones and many other things that actually happen so the 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 reason i i jim may, you may not have actually got an exact answer to your question but the reason is that we are here to chat, question the the thinking of how we can actually use the space technology and actually bring people on who have been in space to actually think about what are the other things that could actually use could be used to map like just like how quentin mentioned we can actually um, look for how the, the the mosquito counts or how we can use ai or how the resources water resources stagnant places or something like that could be mapped so this this is where we have to think through it's a complex topic but yeah these are some things that that has to be brought to attention where multiple different disciplinaries to come should come together and think about it so the other teams who are working here on hydrological and meteorological disaster have it in mind that you know uh, if such each of your cases are actually impacting the biological factors you know if there is a flash flood or if there is a tropical cyclone there is there is a lot of stagnant water which indirectly increases the mosquitoes and the and the vulnerability and everything you know so these are the dependencies on each other so each of your teams are not actually you know solicited teams but actually you have some sort of a connection so yeah uh, maybe we will still try to find a specific person for biology category as well and yeah probably that person could could you know be someone who is working in epidemiology or something like that. yeah uh, is that okay jim like can we move on yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much for all your answers. And indeed, the question was also even to our own participants, not just to the experts. So, Renee, thank you for your answer in the chat. Uh, oh, Renee has answered. Okay, nice. I'm sorry, I haven't checked the chat. Yeah, definitely. If, if participants have any anything to share, because I know it's cross learning, so please feel free to raise your hand to take the question, answer it on the floor. Uh, next, next question. Do we have anyone else here to? Uh, who can raise your hand and ask for it? Okay, uh, so I'll move on with the question that was dropped uh, earlier in the chat uh, with one of the participants, they have to leave uh, earlier. So how can we utilize crowdsourcing applications or citizen science to revolutionize the current space-based technology that we have? So that was uh, one of the questions. I mean, uh, one of the for the for the for the Pacific. I mean, we've been trying to encourage governments to actually consider citizen science as a valid source of information um, to drive, you know, to to actually collect and actually help analyze it against what you know what we have in terms of um, for formal for formal formal sources. And I, I I think this 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 is gonna take. Hopefully, it won't take too long. Um, but I th I think COVID's already responded. You know, shown us that this is actually doable. That you can take feedback from your from 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 people to help inform some of the um, planning that that government makes and and does. Um, for us, it's one that that you know we're having to advocate to actually advocate with government to go, this is a valid source of, of data and, uh, and that not all information needs to be collected just by government. So it's actually understanding that there's, you know, different levels to which data can be collected and that the information that you produce could be varied to meet, to, to take into account where those sources are coming through. Um, I think it's a whole area um, that's probably not utilized to the extent it could be used um definitely definitely for for the pacific anyway something that is for us quite um quite an area that would would actually help fast track some of the decisions and some of the actions that need to take place for disasters um if citizen science were included thank you Rudia. uh i think ahmed uh, has raised his hand if I could just just one point on uh, the, the use of uh, crowdsourcing for space applications specific. 
Um, the thing is, uh, for those of you who, who studied things like remote sensing, not necessarily from space, um, when you take a picture from space, from a drone, from a plane, uh, you cannot use it directly. You will just have uh, relative values. Uh, so let's say if you take a visible picture, you will have some kind of a grayscale um, on, on your pixel. But it's hard to know that this specific value on your pixel, let's say, correspond to a ground, if you do in infrared. So you want to measure the temperature on the ground. If you have the value on your pixel, you cannot associate it directly with the actual temperature on the ground. And, and what you have to do is to calibrate, to know that this pixel value correspond to this truth on the ground. And, and to do that, you need what we call the ground truth. And based on the a few points of truth on the ground, you can calibrate uh, your, uh, your analysis. And so that then you can have the almost truth on all the picture that you took with your satellite. And, and the thing is that um, if we talk about temperature, ground truth is something that it's easy to get in France or Japan because there are sensors everywhere. Um, but in many countries, you don't necessarily uh, have access to that many ground information. And, and I believe that's where uh, things like crowdsourcing could be very efficient to refine the precision of our satellite data. Uh, next question will be uh, Ahmed. I saw him raise his hand. Just a moment. Yeah. Uh, Ahmed, can you go ahead? Uh, can you hear yeah. yeah, go on. Okay. I, um, I'm just wondering um, uh, about the, uh, the, the providing to uh, uh, have the disaster recovery uh, uh, solved, and um, as a, uh, I know that you you will have the IoT satellite, and this will uh, provide us with information that will be necessary to make a project to, for uh, solving the problems or uh, make us uh, understand the, the disaster and how this disaster may affect us. Uh, actually, I have a question here about um, how can I use this satellite because I am. Um, uh, I don't know how can I uh, connect the satellite to ABI or uh, uh, to uh, uh, browser-based application, which uh, will uh, help me to uh, know the disaster and uh, know how to solve it. Uh, uh, that's it. You, you can find a lot of, lot of satellites uh, providing IoT services. There are a lot of universities or companies uh, working on it. Uh, the only case I can talk about is what we do at the University of Tokyo. And, and basically, we are uh, commercializing it um, through a startup company. So I, I don't want to make too much advertisement. So it's called Arcage Space. It's a company that I also work for. And that basically, um, the I would call that a social venture in the sense that the idea is based on uh, small, so nano satellite technology from the University of Tokyo, trying to drive the costs as low as possible uh, for using satellite as a service. And our plan is what we call uh, so satellite as a service. And the idea is to provide very, very affordable solutions uh, for gathering the data uh, uh, through IoT satellites for various type of application, uh, targeting uh, some of the, the the target and indicators of the SDGs. Uh, so, so the, the I think the apart from the company itself, but the, the important point to mention here is that um, space is not anymore uh, a rich countries uh, kind of um, field. Space used to be extremely expensive. Uh, it's not anymore. And now, uh, if you compare, um, so satellites that will be able to, I don't know, have a spatial resolution of two, 2.5 meter on the ground. If you were doing that um, 20 years ago, these were things that only probably five or six countries in the world were able to afford. Uh, it cost billions to have one satellite with these capabilities. Uh, and now this is the kind of thing that universities can develop for $100,000. And even the poorest countries in the world can afford $100,000. Uh, 
And, and we are not even talking about just buying the satellite, but they could also just buy the data. And mm -hmm. if you buy the data from a satellite that costs a hundred thousand dollars, you imagine that it will be much, much, much cheaper than if you were buying it from a billion dollar satellite. So, so the, the, the advance of space technology, miniaturization, uh, more lean satellites make it now able to be used by, by everyone, mostly through constellations of very small satellites. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, so maybe um, I'll have a couple of questions to the speakers here, uh, just to you know make sure that there are some points that are like a takeaway for the participants to work on their uh, research article and everything. So first, let me start with uh, Lydia. Uh, so um, what, what, so the first question would be, how exactly can the team of us, right? The community that can be of help. Like if, if tomorrow we have to give like some tangible solutions, what would be the problem that you can think of to, you know, make us work on? Is there any, you know, prioritized few things that you could provide as a pointer where in general, the participants can take away and work on it. Like that could actually have a real impact if there was any solution to it. Or it could, it could not even be, you know, a couple of points it could be like a generic thing like whether building resilience is a priority or is there a community involvement that is needed? Yeah, go on with your perspective, yeah. Sure, I mean, look, I mean, for the, for the, for the work that we do, actually understanding, one of the, one of the things that we get from um, data service providers, and it's this sanity check that you have with the results that are, that are given. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually matching the your understanding on the ground with what's coming out through analysis and mm. uh, what we're finding is that if we have those conversations a bit more regularly um, we're reducing the need for us to keep going back and forth between qualifying and validating um, some of the results that are being provided so you know forging those relationships those partnerships up front you know now as you know as part of a as, as, as part of this community is actually one in, for, 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 the, for us anyway, I'd see as of great, you know, of great benefit. Um, like, you know, having this sharing platform, we are not just sharing ideas, but you're also querying, um, querying the use of the, of the technology and of the data beyond what it was probably designed for. Um, mm -hmm. And Quentin, Quentin's point on, on, on satellites is one. And I remember the first time we ever got a four meter by four meter resolution satellite imagery. We were all jumping up and down because you could see the actual width of the road. Um, so now when you're actually trying, you know, when you can actually make up shadows, when you can make up cars, you know, that's, it's amazing what we have with, 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 with the technology that's available. But I think the innovation is actually from how do we not start to use some of those products and having those conversations are really something that I, you know, for me, I feel uh, are much needed. Otherwise, we're just talking amongst ourselves um, in, in, our, in, our, you know, in our little groups. Um, it, that's really the benefit that I actually would see from, from, from great groups like this. Thank you so much. So um, I would say the takeaway like for the technology team would be, you know, the complexity of processing the data. Data, there is a lot of data, but whether it is from the, from the point that it is just uh, out of satellite in any form and to actually, you know, uh, actionable insight out of it. So this is the process where the technology team will be covering in. And I hope that that gap is very clear from the decision making point that the data is a lot and it's very hard to get the capacity to do it and yeah so that that will be the takeaway i guess for the technology team to the business it's similar but there is also a concept of uh, what quentin mentioned like data policy whether what kind of uh, data that you like are you going to charge are you going to through something like what is the process of 
you making this data available or you making this insights available to whoever is in need is it going to be like today i have this issue can i call up and get the get the insights like how and how much is the lead time do i have to really have a prior strategic relationship established with the company like a service or something to actually make use of your service or can i just like go in and buy kind of a thing or even if it is for a specific uh, higher level disaster category can i just take your services free so these are the some kind of business models or you know so um, data as a service or insights as a service that you could think of uh, from both of their sessions that i mean that that is what i think of when i listen to these things so i'm just giving as a pointer so that you can align yourself uh, if you are in, if you are stuck but please go ahead with your own perspectives uh, that's the whole point and uh, probably for the community resilience team you have a lot of things to look at um, there is urban policy there is a how are you actually enforcing is the community even reacting like are the community being supportive of all this you know policies because of course there there can be so many things enforced by the government and it comes down to the individuals to actually you know follow it and whether that that is actually to rene's point that is indirectly tied in turn tied to how sophisticated are you to actually you know make follow uh, follow these things it's a luxury sometimes to actually follow the rules follow the policies when you are actually stuck with your life for basic needs so categorize to what are the community that you are actually that that are in affected those probably might not have as many luxuries as we have so look into those aspects and look at in your own specific uh, disasters there might be things that are different you know uh, malaria is completely different from flash floods so flash floods also includes urban policy and everything uh, there is climate policy so look into all of these things it's not just about space policy or you know limited to space technology like look at the root cause of it and try to see if there is anything else from the space that you could try to actually bring in to these aspects and is it, is it even the problem space related or something else you know uh, so i would actually move on to quentin now to have the final takeaway like so to the law and policy team like give you give like a few things that you know they can actually take take it as a pointer to start working the challenges the problems the specificities yeah so that that's complicated and i would say i would like to add something additional from the presentation not just uh, summing up but but really insisting on the fact that um space technologies can be used by everyone for everyone and and it, there there is no not anymore a clear boundary between rich countries with satellites and countries without satellite uh and so there is the issue of the data itself uh that's mostly on what my presentation focused so how do we make sure that the data flows uh, seamlessly uh between countries but there is also the issue of the having access to satellite having access to the satellite infrastructure and, and there is one point i always like to mention when when discussing about development in general and the and, and space technology um it's the fact that um multilateral development banks so like the world bank uh, the asian development bank that are financing the fight against poverty uh are progressively understanding the benefit of space um and but still not enough they are understanding the benefits of using satellite data to support their operations this they are all doing it now all the major um, development banks have teams that do geospatial analysis etc but but there is a, an additional layer that i always try to push for um which is that we should more and more recognize that space is a part of traditional infrastructure um at the almost at the same level as dams bridges roads etc uh that depending on the situation 
having a satellite can be as crucial as having some form of traditional ground infrastructure. Um, and, and the thing is, this is something that big banks that fund this kind of development project still don't involve in too much. But I think that when they talk about infrastructure finance, they should consider that the space infrastructure is also an infrastructure. And, and I want to give a simple example where it makes a lot of sense. So some infrastructure that is sometimes uh, funded by uh, this kind of banks is, uh, you know, communication lines. Uh, but think about a country like Indonesia. Indonesia has how many, is it 12 or 18,000 islands? I know it's more than 10,000 islands. If you want to connect all of this with ground infrastructure, good luck. You will need tens of billions of dollars. However, if you have one geostationary communication satellite, you can do the same quality of communication with all the islands communicating basic information, but also emergency information with $300 million. Still a lot, but much, much less. But this reflects of thinking that uh, another possible infrastructure is in space is something that I feel is still not in the mindset of development experts yet. Um, however, to give them a bit of credit, in the specific case of Southeast Asia and Indonesia, that's where it's currently changing uh, because the Asian Development Bank started to fund partially the, the launch of uh, a geostationary communication satellite. Uh, but so this change of paradigm, I think, will be something that will happen more and more in the coming years, in particular now that satellite technologies are cheaper, um, because that's, it could be really transformative in some, in some cases. Uh, so it's, it's, I'm not really answering your question and takeaway, but, but that's something I wanted to, to insist on. And the main takeaways is really about, so data policy and international coordination on standardization on the technical aspect, but also on the policy aspect to make sure that data can, can flow seamlessly. Thank you, Quentin. I believe that that is most important, the most important uh, aspect of you know, the observation application, the getting the data. That, that, that all comes down to that because that's where everything starts. So yeah, uh, when it comes to data policy, look into the aspect that Quentin has mentioned, the, the two uh, hidden gems the WMO and the uh, German example, and look into the constraints that most developing countries are having in terms of getting this uh, data, whether there are even any policy specifically to it, if, if there is, what is the constraint, and what are the other factors that are affecting to it. And yeah, so with that, I believe uh, we have come to a conclusion. And I thank the speakers for staying on uh, so long to answer all the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Quentin, and thank you very much, Tritya, for joining us today. And uh, thank you, participants, to, to, to be as an enthusiastic listener and you know, question your, uh, uh, yeah, qu question the speakers and being very active. Anyway, uh, we can close off the session today if uh, the uh, participants okay. doesn't have because any more questions. Uh, no, uh, before closing up, uh, I request yeah. everyone to turn on their videos so that we can have a good start. So, yeah. yeah. If you could just turn on your videos, those who are okay. Go, yeah, whoever is comfortable, you can just turn, turn it on. Uh, we can have like a group photo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yep, perfect. Thank you very much, everyone.